Okay, so this is another viewer request video, and this time it's on acidosis and alkalosis. The way I'll go about doing this is I'll talk about the pH scale very briefly. If you took chemistry, you probably know more detail already. Talk about buffers, physiological versus chemical buffers. Then we'll get into acidosis and alkalosis, more dealing with the anatomy and physiology of the body, and comparing the two different types of respiratory and metabolic, and talking about some examples, specifically vomiting and cardiac arrest and some other ones as well. So let's begin with the pH scale. So pH stands for potential hydrogen. So we're measuring the amount of hydrogen in a solution. You probably already know this. We can have an acidic solution or we can have a basic solution. Which one is going to have a higher concentration of protons? Is it going to be the acidic one or the basic solution? Again, you might know this, but if you don't, the higher concentration of protons is in the acidic solution. So that means the basic is lower because these two are opposites. So then that means that the acidic solution is going to have a lower hydroxide ion concentration and the base is going to have a higher hydro hydroxide ion concentration. In case you can't memorize this, I made a little mnemonic here. I took the A from acid and the H from hydrogen ion, which is also called a proton. And I just took the A and the H. I put a bunch of H's and, you know, just to be a little humorous here, you think uh, it's acidic. Like something's very acidic, it's going to burn you. So A for acid, and then the H means there's a lot of H's, so something's acidic. Also, try to be a little humorous here. Base, you take the OH from the hydroxide ion, and you could say O from the OH. O, the base sounds great. So whatever works for you. Okay, so moving on here, we got a container. It's filled with water and then there's some acid and there's some base. If you look at the legend at the bottom left, you will see I have protons in red and I'll see hydroxide ions representing the base in green. So you see more of the red, so you see more protons. And just remember back, more H's. Is that acidic or basic? So remember, ah, uh, right? A, acid, lots of H's, so it's going to be an acidic solution because there's lots of uh, protons in there. There's lots of hydrogen ions. So we just change the colors here. We put more hydroxide ions and those re represent base. So this solution is more basic. Okay, let's continue on here. So pH. pH is inversely related to hydrogen ion concentration. Whenever you see these two brackets like this, it means concentration or amount. So the pH value is inversely, not directly, but inversely related to the amount of hydrogen present. Therefore, let's see if you can solve this question. When there is a high hydrogen ion, or in other words, a high proton concentration, then that solution has a what pH? All right, high hydrogen ion. They're inversely related, so you could pause it and think about it, but I'll continue. So that means it's going to be a low pH. Let's try two questions here. Again, I encourage you to pause and think about it and then continue with me. Number one, when there is a low hydrogen ion concentration, then that solution has a what pH? So this time low hydrogen ion concentration. So they're not directly, but inversely. Inversely meaning opposite. So that's going to be a high pH. Number two. Acidic solutions have a something pH, and basic solutions have a something pH. Well, I gave you that little mnemonic, ah, uh, remember A from the ah uh, means acid and all those H's. So acidic solutions have a lot of hydrogen ions. So if they have a lot of hydrogen ions, is their pH going to be high or low? They're inversely related, so it's going to be low. So it leaves us between choice B and choice D. Continue. Basic solutions, do they have a high hydrogen ion concentration? No, because that's acids, we just said it. So they have a low hydrogen ion concentration. But again, don't get confused. They're going to be opposite, the hydrogen and the pH. So if we have a low hydrogen ion concentration, we're going to have a high pH. So that leaves us with choice D. So let's fill in the rest of this chart. Acids, we look here at the end of acid. Acid, is that going to be a high or a low pH? Well, they're not directly related, they're inversely related. So if you have a high hydrogen ion concentration, 
you're going to have a low pH. And then bases. If you have a low hydrogen ion concentration, then you're going to have a high pH. Okay, so let's take a look at the pH scale. There's a bunch of numbers down there on the bottom. There's exponents. There's negative numbers. There's a bunch of words and things all over the place. But let's just focus on the simple part first, our numbers. The pH scale ranges from 0 all the way to 14. There's a range where there's acid, and there's a range where there's base, and of course there's going to be a cutoff point for that. If you take a look at the chart, what's the range for acid? Well, it's going to be from 0 to just below 7. 7 is not included. So I just wrote, for example, 6.99. And base is going to be right above 7, but not over 14, so 6.99 to 14. So neutral is what we call 7 in the middle. If I go back there, you see 7 is left out there. That's neutral, right there in the center. However, the pH of our blood is not right neutral at 7.0. The pH of our blood, you might know this, is actually 7.4. So if it's 7.4, is this slightly acidic or is it slightly basic? Well, it's above 7. We said it's a higher pH. So a higher pH means what hydrogen concentration? High or low? It means low hydrogen co ion concentration. So that means it's going to be slightly basic. So let's go a little step further here. There's another word you should know for basic that's used, and that word is alkalinic. Just like some batteries you might think about, there are alkalinic batteries because they use potassium hydroxide, KOH, and it releases the hydroxide ions, so they're called alkalinic batteries. Second part, buffers. Physiological and chemical buffers. Simply, what buffers do is they resist changes in pH. So, Let's say, for example, you go running, your exercises. You're going to build up a burn, a burn because it's acid. That acid is what in your muscles? It's going to be lactic acid. So you're building up acid in your muscles. And we said acid is what? Is it a high or a low pH? Well, it's a low pH, so it's going to decrease. A buffer, is a buffer going to act to keep decreasing the pH, or is it going to act to increase it? We said it's going to resist the change. We got acid in our body now being produced, so it's changing. We want to resist that acid change, so it's going to act to increase the pH, and vice versa. If our body started becoming alkaloic, or basic in other words, then the body's going to act to change that pH by decreasing it, because a base is a high pH, so our body will act to bring that down. And that's simply the role of what buffers do. And we have several of them in our body. So how does this work or look like if we want to picture some chemistry involved here? Okay, well there's another step further we have to go in defining acids and bases. Here's a little thing I kind of came up with. Maybe somebody else uses it, I'm not sure. But acids take the A and take the A for add. Acids add protons, hydrogen ions. Therefore they increase their concentration. Bases bind to hydrogen ions. Therefore, they decrease it. When you bind to it, it's not by itself anymore. So it's considered like you're decreasing its amount by itself. Let me show you some examples. Okay, let's take a look at this container again. We have a lot of red. And if you take a look at the bottom left, the red represents the protons, the hydrogen ions. So we have a lot of them in relation to the green. We're looking at the pH, it's below 7, 5.2. So is this an acidic or is this a basic pH? Well, hopefully you got this now. It's an acidic pH. So what does a buffer do? If you missed that, I'll do it again. We just drop these buffers into the solution or in our body or cells would produce them. So what's a buffer going to do? It acts as the opposite thing. So if we have too much acid, it's going to act as a base. If we have too much base, it's going to act as an acid. And to be technical, they are weak acids and weak bases. And if you look at that, they move and they bind to each other. Because if you go back, I said, if we go all the way back, bases can bind to hydrogen ions. So we put the buffer in there, 
if you look to the left, you see that round circle? I said it's the buffer. It's a base buffer. So they're going to attract to each other. And they're going to raise the pH. Let's say, for example, to 7.2. However, what's our blood pH again? It's 7.4. So it needs to actually go up a little bit more, but we'll talk about that later on. So by binding to it, it's kind of like it's excluding it from the rest of the fluid environment. So the only thing we'll consider acid are these one, two, three, four, five red dots, these five hydrogen ions left over. So it's now five to three as opposed to before. We had three extra ones, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It was eight to three. But the buffer came in, the hydrogen went, they bound, and it's kind of isolating it from there. So the pH got to go up. Even though it's still there, it's isolating it from that fluid environment, so therefore, thereby changing the pH. So the buffer acted to resist that change in pH. Let's talk about two different groups of buffers. Phy physiological, renal, which involves our kidneys, pulmonary, which of course involves our lungs. But first we're going to talk about the chemical buffers, the phosphate, proteins, and bicarbonate. Not in too much depth. Maybe I can do that in another video. Let's start first with phosphate. The phosphate buffer. Well, here's that reaction you've probably seen in textbooks. You have two hydrogens. You got a phosphate ion. It can go in both directions. You have uh, monohydrogen phosphate plus another hydrogen. Okay, a bunch of chemistry here. But let's take a look at our solution. So let's ask ourselves this question. Is there a high or low concentration of protons? As I'm asking on the left-hand side of this slide. Well, we see a lot of the red dots. As the legend says at the bottom left, the red dots represent hydrogen. So there's high in relation to the hydroxide, which are in green. So the pH, as you can see, is acidic at 5.2. So this is a high um, concentration. However, it's a low pH in relation to 7.0. It's below 7.0, so it's lower. Okay, so how is this phosphate buffer going to work? Well, we just saw the general idea. Right? We have our phosphate buffer. We're going to add it into solution. And this time, our phosphate buffer, I just changed it down here at the link you'll see below. It says basic buffer is the monohydrogen phosphate right here. So that monohydrogen phosphate is going to combine with the hydrogen and take the reaction to the left or to the right well, there's no way to the, go to the right, so it's going to go to the left and make here H2PO4 minus. And if you look at the pH, well, while we did that here, we had the 5.2, but we added the buffer, and it went up a little bit. I made different colors because it's not exactly into basic environment yet because it didn't pass 7, but it's approaching towards that basic environment. And the phosphate buffer, its optimal pH range is around 6.8. So you just saw in another example of how a buffer acts to resist any changes in pH because before the pH became very acidic for whatever reason, say lactic acid from working out, and now that buffer helped to bring it up to 6.8, trying to bring it back to the body's or the blood plasma pH near 7.4. What about the opposite? Let's say the pH was too high. Well, I don't have an animation about this, but just so you think about it, we would break down more of this H2PO4 minus so we could create more acid. So there'd be a lot more acid to raise up the pH. So we'll just uh, go in the opposite direction towards the right. Let's talk about protein buffers briefly. Protein buffers, borrowing this image from uh, Pearson, they show an amino acid at the center. An amino acid has four groups. It has a carboxylic acid group, a COOH group. It has an amino group, the NH2. It has a lone hydrogen atom. And it has an R group that changes, telling the different amino acids, 20 that are used physiologically in our body, 22 occurring in nature. So let's see what happens. If we go to the right, it says if pH falls. Okay, so a low pH, let's say below 7 or 7.4 for our body. All right, low pH, does it mean a high or a low hydrogen ion concentration? Low pH, they're inversely related, means a high hydrogen ion concentration. And if you look at the solution I put below, you see a lot more hydrogens than you see the green 
hydroxides. So we need to remove them. We need to bind them to something. Well, if you take a look up there, are they binding to the amino group or to the carboxylic acid group? They're binding to the amino group. So now it becomes NH3+. Plus. Let's go the other way. If pH rises, if pH rises, is that acid or base? It's a base. And if a high pH, then what's our hydrogen ion concentration? Well, it's going to be low. So if it's low, like you see in the image down below, we only have about four of them, and we have a lot more of the hydroxide, we need to add more to solution. So somehow the amino acid has to add hydrogen ions. Where is it doing it from? Their carboxylic acid group, the hydroxide ion, is losing that hydrogen, and it's dumping, and that's why it becomes O negative afterwards. So just a little summary info. Carboxylic acid group, COOH, acts as an acid and adds A for acid, A for adding the proton. The amino group, the NH2, acts as a base and binds the hydrogen. So it's going to become NH3+. Plus. Let's talk about the car bicarbonate now. The bicarbonate kind of ties us into our renal and pulmonary buffers. So here's a big equation. You definitely want to know this equation. One, well, you want to be able to write it out for an exam. I usually like to start on the left side. We have H2O, which is water. We have CO2, which is carbon dioxide. H2CO3, carbonic acid, the hydrogen ion, which is a proton, and HCO3 minus, which is bicarbonate. So how do you make that reaction? The way I think about it is I think about what do I breathe out? Okay, we think about oxygen, we think about CO2. We obviously want to breathe in oxygen, so we're going to be breathing out CO2. But how do we know if we breathe out H2O? Well, if you live up north where I do, and it's a cold day and you're outside, you can see that water vapor. So CO2 and H2O on the left-hand side, you breathe them out. Then, very simply, we combine all of those letters together, and we have the H, well, we have two of them. We have the C, one C, we have one from water, the oxygen, and two oxygens from CO2, so we have three of them. And then we're going to split them apart again. And we split them apart, all we're going to do is take one hydrogen off. So we have the hydrogen and the bicarbonate. There is an enzyme, you probably looked it up, carb uh, carbonic acid, which is doing the reaction over here on the left-hand side. This is just going to dissociate in solution. Some people ask me, well, how do I remember which one's carbonic acid and which one's bicarbonate? Well, we said an acid has more or less protons. An acid has more protons. So you see bicarbonate has one, carbonic acid has two. And that's why it's an acid, because it's going to add protons when it, when it leaves one, when it dissociates and adds one to the solution. So carbonic acid has more protons, so it's the H2CO3. Bicarbonate is HCO3 minus. Another random one is that you can think there are two things on this side of the equation, so bi meaning two, so this one's going to be the bicarbonate. Just little ways to remember things. Now, a very important principle. You may not have to know his name on the test, but you need to know his reaction or his uh, idea of how some chemical equations work out. Le Chatelier's principle. And the way Le Chatelier's principle works is it states that we need to look at one side of an equation. And let's say we look at this side over here, we look at the hydrogen ion concentration, and let's say it increases. So we're saying the right-hand side of the equation, we have a product or a reactant that's increasing, that's going up. Le Chatelier says, due to this, we're going to move either to the left or we're going to move to the right. Well, if we move to the right, the reaction is making more hydrogen, making more hydrogen, creating acidosis, which is not good. So the reaction is going to proceed to the other way, to the left, to remove these hydrogen ion concentrations. It works in the opposite way as well. If we have low hydrogen ion concentrations, well, let's try thinking about it both ways. Let's say we go to the left. By going to the left, do we continue to decrease or are we going to make more of the hydrogen? Well, if we go to the left, we just said we're going to decrease it. 
So we don't want to keep decreasing it because now we're not acidosis. We're going to be alkalosis. So the reaction is going to go to the right in order to compensate or to correct for that uh, for losing those hydrogen ions, those protons. Let's look at the other side. Carbon dioxide. Let's say carbon dioxide levels go up. According to Le Chatelier's principle, are we going to drive the reaction to the left to continue to make more CO2, or are we going to go to the right to try to diminish that level of CO2? Hopefully you're understanding this now. We're going to go to the right, thereby diminishing it, because we take the CO2, we combine it with water, we make carbonic acid, and then it breaks down into the proton and bicarbonate. So we're trying to lower it. Anytime you have something that's high, you want to make it low. If it's low, you want to make it high. When you look at this reaction, the big thing to focus on, the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide, because these are what's going to be related pretty much directly. A lot of hydrogen ions, you can create a lot of CO2, a lot of CO2, you can create a lot of hydrogen ions, vice versa, just going back and forth. And just to continue with that, if we had a low CO2, which way is the reaction going to go? To the left or to the right? If we go to the right, we continue to remove the CO2. So we're going to go to the left in order to correct it and make it higher. Let's do a little example using this equation here. So back to our solution. We got our protons, we got our hydroxide ions. There are more protons than hydroxide ions. So is this a high or a low concentration of hydrogen ions? It's a high concentration. Therefore, it's going to be a low pH, like you see at 5.2. So we have a lot of hydrogen ions. Which way, according to Le Chatelier's principle, is the reaction going to go? It's going to go to the left because we need to decrease that concentration. We need to add buffer with these hydroxides so we combine them and then we can remove them to make more CO2, which will eventually breathe out. So we have our buffer. We're going to throw that in there. The buffer is HCO3 minus. Is that carbonic acid or is that bicarbonate? Well, there's only one hydrogen, not two. Right, so this is bicarbonate. If it was two, it would be um, carbonic acid. Don't be confused because bicarbonate has Bi in it. It doesn't mean two hydrogens. So this is bicarbonate, and the bicarbonate will combine with the hydrogen ions. And if you saw the pH, I'll repeat it again. It was 5.2. It went up a little bit. It's not basic yet, but the bicarbonate buffer, its optimal pH is around 6.1. It's uh, a little bit lower than the phosphate, which is around 6.8. So we had the high hydrogen ion concentration, which drove our reaction to the left. Now, more interesting, it seems a little bit more difficult, but if you understand this equation in terms of drawing it out, again, I'll go back. If you can draw this equation, start off with what do we breathe out, water and CO2, combine them and make that. Write it a couple times, you'll get it. And you understand if we increase one side, then the other side, it's going to head towards to increase it. If we decrease one side, we're going to move towards that side in order to increase it. So renal kidneys, pulmonary lungs. Let's just think about this before just getting in depth into the physiology. All right, hold your breath. Okay, not too long. You can breathe now. So here's a question. Did your body make more O2? or more CO2. Well, it would be nice if we just could randomly make O2 without breathing, but obviously it made more CO2. So the CO2 levels increased. So if the CO2 levels are increasing on the left-hand side of the equation, which way are we going to go according to Le Chatelier's principle? Are we going to go to the right, or are we going to go to the left? If we go to the left, we make more CO2. So we're going to go to the right, to try to get rid of that CO2. So what will happen to the amount of hydrogen ion concentration by building up CO2? Again, we build up a lot of CO2. It goes high. So it's going to drive our reaction to the right. So now are we going to make more or less of this hydrogen ion? Well, we're going to make more of it. So let's put this uh, into some sort of sense here. Therefore, hypo, not hyper, but hypo, 
meaning a little. In case you confuse hyper and hypo, hyper, think of hyperactive as a lot. So hypo is a little. Hypoventilation, which is what you were doing, hopefully for not too long, and you're breathing again, is going to cause respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. Well, you don't breathe for a long time. Uh, medically, emphysema, for example, not getting enough gas exchange. Then you're going to cause a lot of hydrogen ions, so you're going to cause respiratory acidosis. So, I mean, you could just figure this out now by knowing the opposite thing, but let's just walk through it. What does hyperventilation cause? Well, ask yourself, by breathing more, are you producing or eliminating more CO2? Well, when we held our breath, our cells kept making CO2 and we had to breathe again. So if we're breathing more, just keep breathing, you know, just keep breathing out more and more, you're going to breathe out more CO2. Now let's go back to our equation. We're hyperventilating. We're breathing out a lot of CO2. Therefore, we're decreasing the amount of CO2. If this reaction is going to go to the right, well, we're using up all that CO2 to make more things on the right. We don't need to make more things on the right because we're losing stuff on the left side. We need to replace it. So this reaction is going to go towards the left. By going to the left, what's going to happen to the right side, specifically as I wrote below, what's going to happen to the concentration of hydrogen ions? Well, we're using them to make more CO2, so it's going to decrease. Therefore, hyperventilation, breathing a lot, causes respiratory alkalosis because we are decreasing the hydrogen ion concentration. When you decrease hydrogen ion concentration, you're creating a basic environment or an alkaloic environment. Let's move on to the third part here, acidosis and alkalosis in a little bit more detail with some examples and tying in respiratory and metabolic to each of those. So you might have figured this out already, but acidosis is when the pH of the blood is below, not 7, but what's the blood pH? Is below 7.4. Or, to be more specific, a range of 7.35 to 7.45. An alkaloic state is going to be above that range of 7.35 to 7.45. Respiratory. Well, when you think of that word respiratory, think of your lungs. Any lung problems that causes your pH to change outside of that range is going to be respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. Again, emphysema being an example. Metabolic, basically when the problem in your body does not involve your lungs. So basically it's your lungs or anything other than your lungs. For example, DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, amongst several other different factors. We'll talk about some as well too. Let's talk about vomiting. So when you vomit, wonderful picture. You're going to throw up. You're going to throw up all that wonderful, great food you just ate, the steak, your creme brulee. But what's being important here is your stomach. Is it acidic or is it basic? Your stomach has hydrochloric acid, so it is acidic. So you're throwing up all that great food and you're throwing up all that hydrochloric acid. So you're getting rid of of acid. You're getting rid of that proton. So are you causing yourself to have an acidoic or an alkaloic state? Well, you're losing protons, so proton concentration is low, so pH is high. A high pH means an alkaloic state. How do you see that? Well, is this acidic or basic? Well, there's a lot more protons than there are hydroxide ions, so this is going to be an acidic state. You throw up, there they go, right out your esophagus, throw them up, you're left just with bases. So basically vomiting is causing metabolic alkalosis. And well, why is it metabolic? Because it doesn't involve your lungs. Anything that involves your lungs is going to be respiratory. Throwing up doesn't have to do with your lungs has to do with the rest of your body, your stomach, whatever other reason. So metabolic acidosis is what happens from vomiting. 
Respiratory acidosis is caused by hyper or hypoventilation. Well, let's go back to our equation here. Let's look at CO2. And when are CO2 levels going to be elevated? If we are breathing a lot or if we're breathing very little? Well, if we're breathing a lot, we're breathing the CO2 out a lot. If we're breathing a little, like I told you to hold your breath earlier, then you're going to be building up that CO2 in your body, thereby driving the reaction to the right, and thereby doing what to the hydrogen ion concentration? You are going to be increasing it. So respiratory acidosis is caused by hypoventilation. Again, going back, you're not breathing a lot, so you're trapping the CO2 in your body, so that's going to increase, driving the reaction to the right, thereby increasing the concentration of hydrogen ions inside your body. So hypoventilation causes respiratory acidosis. So is this creating a high or a low hydrogen ion concentration? Well, I just told you it's going to be creating a high hydrogen ion concentration, which means a low pH, which means acidosis. So how does acidosis affect the heart? Getting a little bit more tricky here. With high levels of protons in the extracellular fluid, pretty much in your blood plasma, it needs to be removed from your ECF to your ICF. It has to be removed into the cells. So there's a sort of fair exchange idea. I'm just calling it a fair exchange. The cell says, I will take hydrogen into my body, into my compartment, the extra intracellular fluid, but in return, I'm going to pump out, what's K plus? I'm going to pump out potassium. That's why you can see kalemia. That's where the K is coming from in Latin for potassium into the extracellular fluid. I borrowed this image here from the website uh, mentioned below. Again, the cell says, okay, there's acidosis going on for whatever reason. You need to remove all these protons. So give me your proton, but in return, because due to the different pumps and different types of channels on the membrane, it's going to send out potassium, thereby causing hyper, meaning a lot, of potassium hyperkalemia. So now, the question, why does this acidosis cause uh, cardiac arrest or heart attacks? Well, we're going to take the protons, we're going to pump them into the cell, and exchange potassium comes out. When potassium comes out, we're increasing the potassium in the extracellular environment. Again, going back to that picture, potassium comes out, now we have more potassium in the extracellular. Why is that bad? Is it's going to depolarize the cells. If we think back to our action potential diagrams, specifically the pacemaker or the nodal cells of the heart, the solid line is where it's supposed to be. However, the dotted line shows what hyperkalemia causes. It elevates it or depolarizes due to a difference in uh, potassium conductance. I would have to make another video to explain this idea a little bit more. But the main idea is because protons go into the cell, potassium comes out, we cause hyperkalemia, it's going to depolarize the inside of the cell a little bit more, and thereby change the heart rhythms, causing arrhythmias or cardiac arrest. And you can see it, it's characteristic usually with this tall T wave, if affecting the rate of repolarization. If you have any video requests, then please email me at my email, jrufael at gmail.com, and I'll be pleased to help you. Thank you.